A buoy is being constructed out of wood and will be used to signal passing boats to boundaries for safety or logical purposes. The primary body of the buoy is made out of a saltwater resistant wood, let's call it maple, with a specific gravity of 0.6, and is a 2 inch diameter cylinder that is 12 feet in length. The buoy will be used in seawater, which has a specific gravity of 1.025, and needs to float such that the top of the buoy protrudes 18 inches from the water's surface. To accomplish this, an amount of steel will be added to the bottom of the buoy body. How many pounds of steel, with a specific gravity of 7.85, should be added? Because this is floating, I can start by recognizing that it must be in equilibrium. So the sum of forces in the y direction must equal zero. I'm going to define my y direction as up in this drawing. Therefore, the force up must equal the force down. I have one up force. It is the buoyant force. Buoyant. And that is counteracted by two weights, the weight of the wood and the weight of the steel. So the buoyant force, which I will abbreviate F-B-O-U-Y, which looks suspiciously similar to the word buoy. I wonder if there's a relationship there. And that's equal to the force of wood. That's the weight of the wood pulling down plus the force of steel, which is the weight of the steel. The buoyant force is going to be equal to the weight of the water displaced by the buoy, as per Archimedes' principle. And I would describe that as the volume displaced, that is, the volume of water displaced by the buoy, multiplied by the density of seawater, multiplied by gravity, and the weight of the wood, I can describe as the volume of the wood in the buoy, multiplied by the density of maple, multiplied by gravity. And the weight of steel, I could rewrite in terms of the volume of the steel, multiplied by the density of steel, multiplied by gravity, but I don't need to, because what I'm looking for is the actual weight of the steel. So all I have to do is some algebra here. The weight of the steel which I'm calling F steel, is equal to the buoyant, nope, try that again, the buoyant force, come on iPad, F B O U Y, minus the weight of the maple. And that's volume displaced, multiplied by the density of water, which is seawater here, multiplied by gravity, minus the force of the wood, which I'm going to write as the volume of the buoy, times the density of the maple, times gravity. The next substitutions that I'll be making are for density. I don't know the density of seawater. In this problem, I was given a specific gravity. So I'm going to say the specific gravity of the seawater is equal to density of seawater divided by the density of water at standard temperature and pressure. Therefore, the density of seawater can be written as the specific gravity of seawater multiplied by the density of water. And following that same logic, I can write the density of maple is equal to the specific gravity of maple multiplied by the density of water at standard temperature and pressure. And that's due to the fact that our specific gravity is defined as density of the thing divided by density of water at standard temperature and pressure. So neat thing about this, you know how pretty much every problem so far, we've been assuming that the water is at standard temperature and pressure. 
We don't even have to assume that here, because that's how our specific gravities are defined. So we can use that same density without that assumption. Isn't that neat? That's pretty neat. We are still assuming standard gravitational acceleration. We could use 9.81 meters per second squared, but since everything else is in imperial, I probably want to use imperial units. It even says pounds of steel. So I'm going to say 32.2 feet per second squared for both gravity terms. Now for the volumes, let's think about the volume displaced first. So I have a wooden buoy that is a cylinder 12 feet long and it is sticking out of the water such that 18 inches is above the water. Therefore, the volume of the wood underneath the water is going to be the cross-sectional area of the circle, which is a circle with a diameter of 2 inches. Multiplied by the height under the water, which is 12 feet minus 18 inches. Plus, I have to account for the steel. So I'm saying 12 feet minus 18 inches. That's the height underneath the water multiplied by pi over 4 times 2 inches squared. So that's the volume of the wood that is underwater. And then I'm adding to that the steel at the bottom. So there's a couple of ways that we could approach this. We could assume that the steel is fabricated as a spike and that it is just rammed into the bottom of the wood such that it pushes the wood fibers out of the way. Therefore, the wood and the steel take up the same volume as the wood itself. But we could also approach it as modeling a block of steel of an arbitrary shape underneath the buoy. Now, we could dig into the details like how our buoy is constructed and how long would a steel spike rammed into the bottom end grain of the buoy actually last in water. But modeling it as an attachment to the bottom of the buoy is easy enough because we know the density of steel which we can describe as the density of water at standard temperature and pressure multiplied by the specific gravity of steel and then we know f steel the weight of the steel is the mass of steel multiplied by gravity, which would be the volume of the steel, steel, multiplied by the density of steel, multiplied by gravity. Therefore, the volume of the steel would be the weight of the steel divided by the density of steel times gravity or F steel divided by specific gravity of steel multiplied by the density of water at standard temperature and pressure multiplied by gravity. And then if I make that substitution up here, so I'm saying plus the volume of steel And there's my volume displaced by the water. I'm still going to end up with one equation and one unknown, so it's okay. The volume of the buoy is just going to be the total length of the buoy, 12 feet, multiplied by the cross-sectional area of that circle. I guess this should really be called the volume of the wood in the buoy. That would be better, but... What's done is done. That would be pi over 4 times diameter of the buoy. 
squared times the total height, which is going to be pi over 4 times 2 inches quantity squared times 12 feet. So we have enough now to start combining things into one equation. So I will write F steel is equal to the volume displaced, which is 12 feet minus 18 inches. times pi over 4 times 2 inches quantity squared plus F steel divided by specific gravity of the steel times density of water. I'm going to just drop all the at STP and assume all density of water henceforth is at standard temperature and pressure times gravity. That's my volume displaced. And then we are multiplying by the specific gravity of seawater times gravity. And then we are subtracting pi over 4 times 2 inches squared times 12 feet times the specific gravity of maple. And I'm going to run out of room, so I will drop this down. Times the density of water. Times gravity. And then next, I will distribute the specific gravity of seawater times gravity into that parenthetical statement, at which point I have F steel is equal to this quantity here. Multiplied by this quantity here. Plus this quantity here and then I subtract this quantity here and then I can bring F steel over so I have F seal, and I'm going to factor that out in one step because I'm starting to run out of room. And as you all know, it's impossible to add a room on a digital workspace like this. So F steel times the quantity one, because I'm factoring it out, minus specific gravity of seawater times gravity divided by the specific gravity of steel times H2O it's density times gravity. And then that's equal to this quantity. Minus this quantity. So I can say F steel is equal to this whole statement divided by the quantity 1 minus specific gravity of seawater water 
divided by the specific gravity of steel times the density of water. Now, this is alarming. Why is it alarming? Because there's so many terms, John. That's a lot of algebra. You're right. That is alarming. You know what else is alarming? I need dimensional homogeneity. So in order to take one, a unitless number, and subtract out something, that something must be unitless. I have specific gravity divided by specific gravity, which is unitless, but then I have that pesky row in the bottom. That density is not unitless, which means this entire term breaks. That is a strong indication that I missed something. So I'm going to go back and inspect this term here. So I was taking the volume displaced and I was multiplying it by the specific gravity of seawater times gravity. And that should have also included the density of water. Which means that I need to go back to this step and I need to add in the density of water here. And that is also going to mean when I distributed that term inside of the parentheses, I need to write it here as well. Density of water and density of water. Density of water. Good thing I got rid of that STP. Which means that I should have density of water here. Hey, look, it cancels. That's nice. And density of water here. So once again, we found ourselves encountering one of those classic, totally intentional, John mistakes that helps us recognize when we may have made errors. Remember, getting good is making slightly fewer errors and knowing how to recognize them and fix them. So this density here disappears, which means that I have dimensional homogeneity, which as you know is all the rage, and also there should be a density of water here, which makes sense because in these sorts of problems, often you can factor out the density of water and gravity. Cool. You want to do that now? Let's do that now. Let's factor out the density of water and gravity. And since I'm out of room, I will just add a new page. Thought I could make it, but I couldn't. And on this new page, I am going to have a whole bunch of arithmetic. But we're not quite there yet. Let's say density of water times gravity, factored out and everything, divided by 1 minus specific gravity of seawater, divided by the specific gravity of steel. Yeah. Okay, and then we are multiplying by our volume of our displaced wood, that's 12 feet minus 18 inches, times pi over 4, times two inches squared times the specific gravity of seawater and I will shrink that down a little bit give myself more room yes yes iPad shrink that parenthesis that's what I wanted and then we are subtracting this stuff Cool. Hey, look. We made our lives a little bit easier by factoring stuff out. Is there anything else that I can factor out? You're right. I can do that. I can factor out the pi over 4 and the 2 inches squared. So let's go density of water at standard temperature and pressure times gravity times pi over 4 times 2 inches squared 
divided by one minus specific gravity proportion of seawater and steel. And now we have 12 feet minus 18 inches times specific gravity of seawater minus, here, let's make that smaller. Okay, here we go. We're going to write real, real well. I have confidence in us. 12 feet minus 18 inches. Everyone knows that when you write small, you have to talk softly times specific gravity of seawater. And then we are subtracting 12 feet times the specific gravity of maple. And if you are sitting there going, John, couldn't we factor out 12 feet as well? You're right, we could. We could bring this inside and then factor out 12 feet. And then we'd be left with a specific gravity of seawater divided by 12 feet and then some other terms, but but I'm okay with our current level of optimization. It might not be the highest level of optimization possible, but I think it's good enough for now. Now let's start computing. So I'm going to start plugging in numbers for real here. We have the density of water at standard temperature and pressure. We're going to go look that up in table A1. Are you ready? Here we go. Table A1, it is at 20 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere. Density of water is... 1.937 slugs per cubic foot. 1.937 slugs per cubic foot. And then we are multiplying by 32.2 feet per second squared. And then we are multiplying by pi over 4. And then we are multiplying by 2 squared inches squared. And then we are dividing by this cool unitless proportion. Specific gravity of seawater. I'm writing small, so I'm talking small. Specific gravity of steel. And then we are taking that quantity and multiplying by a length. So I am going to write that length in feet. So I'm breaking my cardinal rule. I'm doing some mental math. Hopefully you guys can forgive me. I guess I don't have to. I could write this as 18 over 12. Yeah, I'll do that instead. Don't want to break my cardinal rule. That's like the most important one. The prime directive of calculating quantities. 12 minus 18 over 12. Times specific gravity of seawater. Hey, I'm plugging in numbers. Why didn't I plug in numbers down here? John, what are you doing? Specific gravity of seawater was 1.025. That is 1.025. And then specific gravity of steel was 7.85. 7.85. And then back over here, multiplying by the specific gravity of seawater. That's 1.025. And then we are subtracting 12 times the specific gravity of maple which was 0 0.6. And that entire quantity is in feet. Okay, now. We're going to have to continue because we want an answer in pounds. So I will start by recognizing that one pound, you'll notice I'm starting at my destination and working backwards, one pound of force is one slug, multiplied by 1 feet per second squared. And so far, slugs cancel slugs. 1 foot cancels 1 foot. Second squared cancels second squared. I have feet in the numerator, square inches in the numerator, and feet cubed in the denominator, which means I need 12 inches in 1 foot. Square everything, square everything, square everything, square everything. 1 squared is boring. Inches squared cancels inches squared, and then square feet, and... Feet cancel cubic feet. Aha. And that will yield an answer in pounds of force. Okay, calculator, come back. I know it's been like 45 minutes. Here we go. 1.937. I'll 
add some parentheses just for good measure. 1.937 times 32.2 times pi times 2 squared. What do you think? Do we take the time to find the carrot? Let's find the carrot. 2 carrot, that's pi. Come on, calculator. Carrot 2, aha, we did it. Multiplied by 12 minus 18 over 12. You guys didn't break the cardinal rule. Times 1.025 minus 12 times 0 0.6. Close parenthesis. And that is divided by 4 times the quantity 1 minus the quantity 1.025 divided by 7.85. Was it 7.85? Let me just double check. Good. 7.85. And then, closing parenthesis, times 12 on the quest for the carrot, got it, squared. Now, how many closing parentheses do we need? Apparently that number is sufficient. Let's double check, that doesn't look like it's missing anything important. I think those parentheticals make sense. Okay, here we go. Answer is 5.5. 5 pounds of force. So that is the weight of the seal. Again, we got there by figuring out how much volume there would be if we attached a steel mass to the bottom of the wood. Now, out of curiosity, how much would our answer have been affected if we had assumed that the volume of the steel was insignificantly small? That is, so small relative to the volume of the buoy that we could ignore it altogether. Well, I'm glad you asked. If we had assumed that our volume of our steel was insignificant relative to the volume of the wood, then we would have had a much easier calculation because this would have been just the volume of the wood displaced and that was pi over 4 times 2 inches squared times the height which was 12 feet minus 18 inches which I'm going to write as 12 minus 18 over 12 feet times the specific gravity of seawater which was 1.025 1.025 times the density of water which I'm going to choose to factor out times gravity which I'm going to assume or which I'm going to choose to factor out minus the volume of the buoy as a whole which was 12 feet times pi over 4 times 2 inches quantity squared times the specific gravity of the maple, which is 0 0.6. And at that point, we have factored density of the water, which was 998 kilograms per cubic meter. Nope, nope, John. Metric is not what we want right now. Back to the table, it was 1.937. 1.937. Yeah, 1.937. I can remember that. 1.937. It's like a different number, but not. Slugs. Or cubic foot times a page turn, apparently. Times 32.2 feet per second squared. Aha, okay. And then I'm going to be as efficient, i.e. lazy, as possible. I'm going to factor out 2 inches squared and pi over 4 again. So now I have 12 minus 18 over 12 feet times 1.025 minus 12 feet times 0 0.6 and then I'm multiplying by the quantity 1.937 slugs per cubic foot times 32.2 feet per second squared times Pi over 4 times 2 squared inches squared. 
And then again, in order to get pounds, to recognize that a pound of force is one slug times one beat per second squared. And then 12 inches in the denominator is one foot in the numerator. Square everything. So I have feet inside of this quantity here. And that feet is going to cancel this feet. And then second squared cancels second squared. Slugs cancel slugs. Square inches cancel square inches. Feet and square feet cancel cubic feet, leaving me with pounds of force. Therefore, I can take 12 minus 18 over 12 times 1.025 minus 12 times 0 0.6. And I think that's the appropriate number of parentheses, let's hope. 1.937 times 32.2 times pi. And just for funsies here, I'm going to write times 2 times 2. And then we are dividing that, hoping that we had a leading parenthesis. And we had 4 in the denominator and 12 squared. Use a carrot again, just, you know, keeping you guys on your toes. We had a syntax error, which means we forgot our leading parenthesis. He said, hoping he had forgotten the leading parenthesis. Now, I don't want to retype this all, so how do I switch my calculator into insert mode? Is it? No, it's not that. Is that? No. This week on Fluid Mechanics, John tries to figure out how to run his calculator. Okay, no. Oh, wait. Okay. So, let's just hope for the best and get rid of one of these. I think, no, no, that didn't work. Okay, I gotta start all over. This time with a leading frenzy, and all because my calculator is in overwrite mode, as opposed to insert mode. And now it's in alpha mode. Calculator. Okay, you know what? I'm just gonna reset you, emulator. That's what you get. Okay. By the way, I'm hoping that I'm going to remember to cut all this out, but if you're seeing it, that's a sign that I did not remember to cut all this out. So here we go, calculating that quantity for the first time, totally the first time. I'm going to add three parentheses this time, 12 minus 18 over 12 times 1.025, and then we are multiplying that by nothing. We are subtracting 12 times 0 0.6, and then we are multiplying again by 1.937 times 32.2 times the pi symbol times two caret two quantity divided by four times 12 squared. And we get 4.84 pounds of force. 4.8476 pounds of force. So if we had neglected the volume occupied by the steel, we would have been off by, what, like 12%? Is that significant? I don't know. Depends on the circumstances. Minus 5.575 divided by 5.575. Yeah, we had about a 13% error. That's fun. And then just... To not confuse people who only look at the solution and don't watch this video, I'm going to get rid of this. There we go. Look. That was a fun aside we did. And then again, we could have a conversation like, how about if this were floating in regular water instead of seawater? Would you need to add more steel or less steel in order for it to still protrude 18 inches? If you said less steel, you're right. Regular water is not going to be as dense, which means that the same buoy would sit lower if it had the same amount of steel. 
So in order to get back up to 18 inches, we need to get rid of some of the steel.